Hello, this is Ryan with Deepwood Handcraft, bringing you this video today from the kitchen table in our cabin in the back country of Alaska. Um, in this video, we're going to start taking more of an in-depth look at our processes and how we take these projects from hide to finished product. This is by no means an exhaustive look or a how-to or tutorial or anything like that. Um, but it will give you an idea of just exactly what we do and how we do it. I do share several tips and some methodology and a little bit of theory behind the reasons we do what we do. So in this video we're going to be taking a look at the making of a very custom Buckeye uh, for a retiring police officer. Mark, congratulations on your retirement. Your boys have contracted a custom project for something that they think that you will really enjoy and if you're into this kind of thing I think that you'll enjoy it also so I wish that I had this thing completed and in your hands as of your retirement party um, but you're just gonna have to wait just a little bit longer this thing is gonna ship out on Monday and be to you three to five days later so by Friday of next week, you should have this bag in your hands. In the meantime, you're just going to have to wet your whistle on this video. As of the time that I post this on Friday, this bag is not yet completed. But by the time you're watching this video, it should be well on its way. So I'm going to break this video down into two parts because I did not have time to shoot everything and edit everything and carry it all to town to upload it because our internet out here is prohibitive for that sort of thing. So this is part one. I'm going to start taking a look at our processes and then part two. We will be finishing everything up and going over the final product. This bag has a bit of a surprise and Jordan wanted me to talk about all of that in this video and I don't think I'm going to do that. I think it's going to be a surprise at least until part two comes out, in which case you should probably have the bag in your hands by then. <coughs> um, but it's good stuff. It's something completely new that I haven't done on any of my other stuff. I will put a link in the description of this video so that you can see what a Buckeye really looks like um, when it's all done. Yours is a bit different, but it'll give you a good idea of what you are going to be getting in the mail next week. So stay tuned and uh, congratulations on your retirement. I hope that you uh, enjoy yourself and don't get too busy. Try to take your new hobbies one at a time, that kind of thing. My father was also a police officer who has retired and is living the dream up here with us now. So maybe one day you'll come up here and see what life is all about in Alaska. In the meantime, enjoy this video.
Alaskan red salmon. Gotta eat. Keep my strength up. So I can make this back. Caught locally. Canned locally. Very locally. The only thing is, is trying to keep it all. Is in the this right gonna be right? Is the question. This is gonna be right. If I did it that way, that would be right. Yeah. And give an extra accent around the back of the bag. That's gonna be super tedious to sew that way, though. But it would probably be worth it. I'm not sure how else you're going to get that panel in there. Well, I could just sew it to where the D-rings and the... I mean, there's D-ring holders going top and bottom here. Oh. Uh, so I could just kind of make, make it, it an inside thing. That was the original plan. Mm -hmm. It's 10.30 right now. This really is the land of the midnight sun. Don't mind the mess we live here. Uh -huh. A quick little tour. That's the stove. That is it. Everything gets cooked on that. The water gets heated up on that. That's what happens. That's what the kitchen table usually looks like. Multiple projects all the time. This is 9 10 ounce veg tan or the strapping. This is 14 ounce, 12 to 14 ounce saddle skirting. Looks more like 10 over here, which is what I want anyway, so. This piece is going inside the bag for a super top secret surprise. It has never been done in a Buckeye before or anything I've ever made, but might become a standard. That's why we take the custom orders. Try out all kind of fun new ideas. Is this 12 by 14, right? Mm hmm. This is a Lansky diamond rod. It used to collapse down inside a black handle. 
but the uh, thing they had to tighten it into place was plastic so it broke so I took it out and glued it into an antler and it's not going to break now I normally use a, the diamond side of a DC4 for this job but uh, I lost the diamond side of my DC4. How do you lose one side of a two-sided stone? It comes unglued, of course. It's six years old. Six years old, and I wear it in my pocket every single day. You're going to use shears for leather craft and you're not a big company. It is pretty essential that you learn how to sharpen your own scissors. This is not hard to do. It takes a little bit of patience. You can pretty much see that edge working though. And you'll know whether you've succeeded or not as soon as you put them to your leather. Okay, attempt number two of cutting this. My favorite hide. This is something else you stuck in antler. <laughs> this was a Fisker's. It's not an X-Acto knife because that's a brand, and this blade is a lot thicker than the X-Acto knife I think blades. It's a crafting knife. No, it was a Fisker's something or other. The handle was a circle that you wore on your finger and held it basically like this to cut stuff and that thing would eat my finger alive cutting thick leather so I cut it all off into a little nub and the nub was not enough so I cut all that off and glued in some antlers and now it's not going to break and I can't find the replacement blades for it so I just sharpen it myself So it's not that I just like putting antler handles on everything. That's just what happens when it breaks. I got lots of antlers. Oh, this is gonna be... you have a matching set. And this is the awl that I bought from Tandy. It used to have a wood handle on it, and uh, the blade is really good. This is the original blade I started the whole show with, but the handle, on the other hand, was a uh, craft tool crap. And it broke, and when it broke, I epoxied it into an antler handle. And now it's not going to break. And a lot of people try to hold their shears like this. This is how I hold my shears more control, much more power in your grip, doesn't break your hand, I can't even fit my fingers in there. Shameless plug, fire kits are going up in stock in the next day or two probably, as soon as we get into town and uh, are able to update the website. And I am getting tired because I know it looks like it's a uh, early evening out there, but it's actually like midnight right now. We like to burn the midnight oil around here.
I'm not really going to recess these stitches, but that's a good way to mark the seam. Here's a number four on this thicker stuff. Beveling your edges is by no means just an aesthetic thing. While it certainly does make the project as a whole look better to have all your outside edges beveled, it actually is a, a structural integrity thing in the relationship between the top grain of the hide and the flesh side of the hide. Um, if you just have a sharp corner on that especially on this top side, if that's a sharp corner all along your edge, then any time that gets bumped or suffers any kind of abrasive action, it's going to start to separate from the flesh. And then you end up with uh, problems. I've got a buddy who is a bush pilot. He's actually the one forging the steel strikers for these fire kits that I mentioned. These are going up in stock on the website deepwoodsleather.com I don't put ads on my videos, I put ads in my videos hmm. um, but he says that they camphor the edges on everything, that's what he calls it camphors the edges on everything otherwise it will and he's talking I guess aluminum and steel it will separate into layers and it can shear off during flight and all kind of I don't know, that's kind of over my head with the whole plain stuff, but same principle. He recognized right away because I was showing him some leather craft that that's an essential part of the deal. It's not an option, shouldn't be an option. If your leather crafter is giving it to you as an option, they're not real sure what they're doing or why they're doing it. Sometimes it smells funny out there. It's probably a beard. Uh, Roger said that there, the grizzly out at the river is a friggin' has two cubs. A sow? Yeah. yeah. Like two young cubs. So that's something we really have to keep an eye on. Hope she stays at the river. She won't. The river is only like a quarter mile away. Is she the one that was chasing that moose the other day? I think she killed that moose. He said that that uh, calf that they rescued was just a tiny little baby. New. Brand spanking new. That they just calved. Like, yeah. I wonder like if that this was, past month. Yeah, that mama calf we've seen. The one that's been around? I bet it is, actually. She, we were, you think that was her that we saw in the wetlands? It might have been. Tuesday? That was a big, that might have been a bull, though. I don't know, it didn't have a rack. It was very big. By the way, the dog should like stay out all the time, you know. Good luck with that. That's probably who got that cow. Yeah. If she's got two brand new cubs, she's hungry. Something. Conversations we have at the dinner table. Now it's not recommended that you use a hammer for your punches. But I destroyed my punching mallet while working on my snow machine at negative 15 degrees last winter and have been unable to locate a decent mallet. I've bought like four now and they've all been garbage. 
So I don't care if I mushroom my tool heads, I can just throw them on the sander at some point. I'm going to replace all these craft tool things anyway, as soon as I'm able. Because as you can see, this is like my fourth or fifth probably six hole punch. But they come in handy. It's nice to have a five hole punch and a three hole punch. I use four millimeter on everything because it's uh, we do everything on a quarter inch. It's just easier that way. Okay, the body of this bag is different a little bit than other Buckeyes. Normally I use um, Kodiak oil tan sides, which is a utility grade leather. But this bag being that it is special and custom, um, I've decided to use French Bull from Remy Carey at Tanneries in France. This is a chrome tan, drum dyed leather made from the uh, skin of adult bulls and this is probably in my opinion the finest or at least one of the finest leathers made and available on planet Earth. I don't know if you can see because of the light but the grain and the character of this is just beautiful. It's got a good stretch and pliability but it's probably the strongest bag weight leather that I can get my hands on. It's just really good stuff. So anyway, these are the parts and pieces. You can see we're still in process here. All the seams will be hidden on the inside of the bag. This stuff just feels smooth as butter. It's beautiful stuff. So anyway, this is 9 10 ounce veg tan, closer to 9 to me. For the D-ring holders, it's already been uh, dyed and now I'm going to show the whole world my Obanoff treatment that I do on all of my veg tan. First I'll take off the ring so it doesn't scar up the leather and we'll spend the next several days looking for that. Everybody kind of has their own process. This is mine. I use Obanoff products on everything. Um, this is tested and proven by Leather Research Laboratory to resist dynamic and static water penetration, scuffing and abrasion, caustic chemicals, manure, acid, salt, premature cracking and parching, stitch tear and dry rot, mold, bacteria and mildew. This was originally designed for wildland firefighters to treat their leathers with because they were having problems obviously fighting fire in leather boots and with leather belts and leather gear and so this stuff is where it's at in my book and I'll do a whole thing on this how to treat the stuff you already have kind of thing at some point And so right now I'm not being incredibly conservative with this or anything. It's the sound of my water pump in the background there.
because the dye on this stuff has really sucked the uh, moisture and the oils out of the leather because of the finishers and dryers in the dye. You don't want to over oil this stuff but at this point I'm going to wipe the excess oil off and then I will put the Obanoff heavy duty leather protector on it to finish it off. You'll have to forgive the sound of freedom in the background there. The wife is making our breakfast which usually consists of bacon and some kind of rice or oatmeal or some hot cereal. Not the kind you buy in a box with Lucky Charms on the cover. So now we're going to use the heavy duty LP. You can see the oil has soaked in and this stuff is just about dry to the touch. It's not overly greasy or overly oily. Any excess oil that's on the surface I just wipe off with a rag. I get these rags from um, Fred Meyer in town in a big bag. They're just cut up t-shirts, 10 bucks. It lasts me probably two months. So you can't beat that. Anyway, you can see it's darkened up a little bit as it soaked that oil in. You check around. A tub of this is $15. I go through this stuff really quickly. If you use this for personal use, this tub will last you probably forever. Unless you just have gobs and gobs of leather gear. Um, in which case, it'll still probably last you forever. But they sell it in different sizes, so you don't have to buy this one. You can get the smaller one for personal use. It's about half the price. 15 bucks. Save your leather. If you've got leather, you should be maintaining it. So a little goes a long way with this. I'm not getting large amounts of this or anything. I do want to make sure I have enough on the surface. Make sure to get all the little nooks and crannies. And then I'm going to use the heat for my hands. Just to warm the leather up. Open up the pores so this stuff soaks in. And then I'm going to set this one off to the side and let that soak in for a moment. Okay, now this stuff is pretty well soaked in. You can see that it's a little bit more shiny, but not wet. You don't want to gob this stuff on. You don't want this stuff to be dripping with oil after it's soaked in, and you don't want it to just be totally saturated with the Obanoff. But you do want to provide, at least in the very beginning, a good replenishing of the natural oils and this stuff has beeswax and propolis and all kind of stuff in it that will penetrate down into the surface and protect the leather from all that stuff I named before. Now a lot of people will just finish their outside of their leather. You should be treating the inside of your veg tan stuff as well, not just the top side but also the flesh side. This is most likely where you're going to get your mold and mildew and those kind of things if you get your stuff wet. You should be uh, treating this stuff both sides. Now, if you're doing your boots, you don't want to treat the inside of your boots or that kind of thing, but this kind of stuff, especially strapping and those kind of things, I treat both sides of it. So now you can see it's kind of gotten a little waxy. It's starting to dull up a little bit get like a matte looking finish. So what I'll do now is usually I'll just just get my fingers wet with this. Can't tell there's any noticeable amount. They're just kind of wet with it. I'll go over it just one more time to kind of wet the surface again.
And then with my open off rag, I'm going to buff. This is going to take any of the excess dye off the surface. And also buff that open off into the surface. It's going to pull any of the excess oils and stuff. off the surface. <coughs> and so you can see it's got a nice shine to it without being just terribly glossy. It's not overly saturated but it is still has good form and it feels buttery soft on the surface and not in a wet or greasy way. It feels dry to the touch but you can tell that there's wax in it. So that's how all of my veg sand gets finished.